Hi there, this is a lengthy but in-depth look at APIs in Bubble and it's aimed at complete beginners. It's really the tutorial I wish I'd had a couple of years ago. So in it we're going to start with the complete basics of APIs and what they are. Then we're going to start looking at API documentation which once you understand it, it really unlocks a whole world of APIs for you to integrate with. And then finally we're going to look at how to integrate Unsplash API with Bubble using the API connector. Unsplash is a stock photography website. It's one of the easier APIs to use. Uh, so I thought it was a good way to get started. I hope you find this useful and without further ado, let's dig in. Right, so in this section we are going to talk about APIs and my number one goal is to not scare you off trying them out um, because when I first started learning APIs um, I just found there were certain things that really put me off them and I found them a little bit too complicated and as a result I didn't touch them for quite a long time or I kind of only did when I had to and now after a few years of actually just practicing with them and getting better and better uh, I realized that I should have just dived in at the deep end at the beginning and really there is just a lot of jargon that can be kind of off-putting but once you get the hang of it uh, they're not actually that difficult. So uh, my goal is not to scare you off and just to um, entice you to learn a bit more and play around with them because they are so powerful and they can really make a huge difference to your app and they are often a lot easier than you think they're going to be um, to actually use. So this snazzy image here uh, I got from Midjourney. I just asked it to do a picture of an application programming interface and this is what it came up with. Um, I don't know if it's completely accurate, but it gives you some idea of um, apps talking to each other, which I think is really the, the fundamental thing about APIs. That's what they are. They are, they essentially allow one app's capabilities to be utilized by other apps. Um, by allowing them, by giving them a way to communicate securely between each other. So they are used everywhere. So for example, if you've ever used a price comparison website to book your travel, um, they will use APIs to get all the prices for all the flights and for all the hotels so that you can compare them. And then you'll click through and you'll probably book on the, you know, a different site, which is also using APIs and stuff to pull all those prices together and also allow you to book through them. So for the flight companies and the hotels, it makes perfect sense for them to allow their data to be used by other apps because they are ultimately getting sales from it. So some APIs like those um, make complete sense because you know the company is benefiting from sales for them. So they might actually make those APIs completely free to use because they are getting a, a secondary benefit of you using their data. Um, but then there are other APIs that might cost money because your app is the one benefiting. So for example, OpenAI who make ChatGPT, uh, they don't really get any benefit from you using their AI APIs within your product. So in their case, they charge you to use their API in their product. And as another infamous example, Twitter used to have a free API until very recently. And as a result of that, there was a huge ecosystem of apps and businesses that were built using Twitter data. And then Elon came along and he said, no, actually, we're going to start charging $42,000 a month to use the API. And that overnight, that killed hundreds, if not thousands of these small businesses that were using the Twitter API. But enough about that. Um, let's dig more into the basics of what an API is. So imagine you're going to a restaurant with your family or friends and it's a burger restaurant and you know that you want to have burgers. So what do you do? You order a burger. And the restaurant obviously receives the order and they send, give it to the chefs. The chefs cook your burgers and then they send you a burger to your table or three burgers. So in this case, you have made a request and the restaurant has given you a response, which is the burger on your plate. So the core principles of APIs is very similar to this, except instead of you and your family, it's one app, it's your app, say. And instead of the restaurant, it's another app and you are communicating with that app through requests and responses. And the core principle of APIs is as simple as this. It's two entities exchanging information. Um, but the key difference is that whereas in this example, you are humans talking to another human, the waiter, to order your food, and they are talking to other humans, the chefs, to cook your food, um, there are many humans involved in the interaction and that means you do not have to be particularly precise about 
how you're ordering, the way you do it. You may do it over the phone, you may do it via an app, you may do it in person or at a drive through um, but the request will be received by the waiter and they will interpret it um, probably accurately just based on their knowledge of human language and things like that. And so the chances are you will get a burger back in response. Whereas with an API, there are no humans involved. It is one application talking to another. And applications and computer programs in general do not cope well with imprecise or unclear information. So as a result, you have to be much more careful about the structure of the information you provide and the format you provide it in and the structure and format of the information you get back. So say, for example, you've gone to this restaurant and ordered a burger, but they replied, well, we don't actually serve burgers because this is a Chinese restaurant. Now, in a human example, this would just be a simple misunderstanding and maybe you'd go to another restaurant or maybe you'd change your order. But for two apps trying to communicate through an API, this kind of response would be classed as an error and the app would likely not know what to do in this situation. And when you think about it, there are actually quite a lot of social norms and unspoken rules when it comes to ordering things from restaurants that if you say went on holiday in Japan, assuming you're not Japanese, um, and you try to order food from a restaurant, you might struggle because you might not know the social norms or simply the process for doing so. So for example, in order to be able to order food in a restaurant, you first need to see the menu and you need to know what they have so you can choose what you want. You also need to know if you're going to be ordering through a waiter or if you're going to be ordering as a drive through or through an app or going up to the counter to order. And you'll also need to know whether you need to book a table in advance or whether you can just show up and walk in. So all these little peculiarities about specific restaurants are things that we would either know or we would maybe get from doing a Google search. But when it comes to APIs, they also have their own peculiarities and their own way of doing things. Each API has its own specific way of doing things. So just like most restaurants will have a website or a Facebook page and they'll have a menu and things like that so you can find out how it works, uh, APIs will always have API documentation which lets you know how your app can interact with their app. And the great thing is once you learn how to read this documentation, you'll start to find that you can actually interact with many, many more APIs than you ever thought because although the documentation can look a bit daunting at first, um, actually it's all very, very similar. And once you've done a few, it really opens up a world of different API possibilities. So we're going to dig into how to read API documentation a bit later on. But just think of it as the computer equivalent of just looking at a menu in a restaurant and trying to figure out the opening times and what you need to wear to get in and whether you need to book before you go and so on. So let's say this is your bubble app in the middle of the screen. And here we have an external app. Now there are two different ways you can use APIs with bubble. One is to receive incoming API requests from other apps, and the other is to make outgoing API requests to other apps. And the difference between these two is that the incoming API requests are triggered, the interaction is triggered by other apps, whereas the outgoing API requests are triggered by your app. And by far the most common of these two are outgoing API requests, where your app is triggering an interaction with a third-party app. So just to give you some examples of the two types, so incoming API requests, so say for example your app is a fitness tracker and another fitness app wants to be able to pull data from it, uh, then it might send you API requests and you'll send data back. Say your app is a CRM and a company wants to update its Google Sheets with data from your app, then it will use your API to do that. Or say your app is a job board and there is another job board aggregator that wants to use your job listings, um, then you would open up an API so that they could do that. So in other words, your app needs to contain some kind of useful data or be able to do useful things in order that other apps will want to access it via an API. On the contrary, outgoing API requests are where you want to augment the functionality of your app using other services. So for example, say you want to send an email from your app, but you want to use a third party email service provider like SendGrid, uh, or say you want to pull an image from an image library like Unsplash, or you want to send new signups on your website to a third party service like Airtable or HubSpot or ConvertKit, or you want to send a prompt to OpenAI so you can get ChatGPT to give you an AI generated response 
or say you want to pull data from an Airtable database into your Bubble app to show to your users, or you want to use Google Maps locations within your app. All of those are examples of outgoing API requests, uh, and they are essentially other apps making your app better because you can use their services or data. And by the way, APIs doesn't necessarily mean you need to talk to third-party apps. You can also use them to communicate between your own apps or even within your own app. So, for example, if you're using an external database with your Bubble app like Xano, then your front end will be communicating with the Xano database via an API. Uh, Tesla uses APIs to provide software updates to its cars. Amazon uses APIs to connect with its logistics companies. And Netflix and Spotify use APIs to deliver their content. So just because it's called an API doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a third party app. It might be your own app communicating with itself or with other apps that you've built within your own ecosystem. So as I've said, outgoing API requests are by far the most common use of APIs for most apps. So we are going to cover incoming API requests, but the majority of the stuff we're going to cover is outgoing API requests. But just to avoid any confusion, there are two completely different places within the Bubble app that you would access these two different types of API requests. So the incoming API requests is in the Bubble editor in the settings tab in the API sub tab. And there is a box there you'll see next to enable data API. And ticking that box will mean that you can then expose an API that other apps can use to send incoming API requests to your app. And for outgoing API requests, that is when you use the Bubble API Connector plugin. So this would be on the plugins tab of your editor, and you actually have to find the plugin and install it. And once you do, you'll find that it's like the most useful plugin and almost every Bubble app uses it. So it's a really, really great plugin. And we're going to dig much more into how to use that later on. But just to be clear, when we are using the API connector, we are only talking about outgoing API requests, which are the most common ones. So before we get into playing around with APIs for real, I just wanted to give a little bit more information about how they work, just so that when we actually start using things, you have a better understanding um, of what all the terms mean. Because I think one of the, the hardest things about APIs really is that it just uses some terminology which... Uh, sounds a bit strange and unusual and that can be quite off-putting especially for no coders where we're kind of used to using very plain clear uh, English language so let's imagine our bubble app is here on the left on the right is the Airbnb API which um, actually is not publicly available so this is just a completely made up example um, but let's say we want to access that API and we want to get some information from Airbnb so what we'll find is all APIs offer a kind of menu of different functions that you can access using the API. And you find that menu in the documentation and it will tell you exactly what you can do. But for most APIs, the menu is very, very similar. So examples of things that might be on the menu could be, in the case of Airbnb, the ability to view all listings. And by view, I mean retrieve all listings and use them on your bubble site. Uh, the ability to view just one listing, um, the ability to search listings by certain terms, uh, the ability to search users, the ability to create a listing, and the ability to update a listing. So there are likely to be many more things than this that you can do, um, but these are definitely some of the things that you would be able to do with a hypothetical Airbnb API. Now, each one of these different menu items or functions are called an endpoint. And all an endpoint really is, is a URL. Just like the ones we are used to for accessing every website on the internet. As you probably know, a URL is simply an address at which you can find a website. And APIs use URLs as well, with the key difference being they're not supposed to be visited by humans. These URLs are supposed to be visited by applications, by computers. So the URLs here I put for these endpoints are ones that I just made up, so they don't actually work, but they are kind of close examples of what the real URL might be if Airbnb had a public API. So as you can see here, the top one, view all listings, it's got api.airbnb.com. So a human goes to airbnb.com, a computer goes to api.airbnb.com, and then it's got a, a slash v2, which might be the version number of the API, because every 
So often they might completely update their API and they want to make sure that people who are using the older version can keep using it. So they'll just add a, a new version number. And then they will have a very kind of structured series of URL paths. So just like if you're going to a website and it's usually got a slash blog and then slash kind of category and then slash name of post and it's all quite nicely organized like that or it should be if they if they care about SEO. Um, for APIs, it's also quite nicely organized because that just makes it more predictable and easier for other apps to use it. So for the view all listings endpoint, you might have slash view slash listings. And then for the view one listing endpoint, you might have slash view slash listing singular. And then for search listings, it might be slash search slash listings. And then search users might be slash search slash users and so on. And it's often the case that you can actually do multiple different kinds of functions using only one endpoint. So in the examples at the bottom, create listing and update listing, they could actually both be done on the same URL, which is just slash listing. And the way you would communicate what action you want to take on that endpoint is by using what's known as methods. And the standard methods are the following ones, get, post, put, patch, and delete. So these are terms which are a bit strange, of course, and a bit difficult to understand, but uh, essentially they're very simple. Get means retrieve, so you want to get data from the other app. Post means create, so you want to create data on the other app. Put means you want to update data on the other app. Patch means you want to completely replace a piece of data on the other app. And delete, of course, means you want to delete data on the other app. So these are the five most used methods when it comes to APIs. And of those five, I would say get and post are by far the most common ones that I use. I very rarely use the other three. So when you combine a method and an endpoint, you are giving the API enough information about the data that you want to access and what you want to do with it. And you will almost always need both of them together. So to go back to our restaurant analogy, the endpoint would be like picking an item from the menu and the methods well there aren't that many methods you can have at a restaurant but uh, the two main ones I can think of would be to eat in or to take out so in a Starbucks you could choose a coffee from the list but unless you tell the server what method you want to use i.e drink it in or take it out they won't know what cup to give you so they won't be able to serve you your drink in the same way you can tell the Airbnb API that you want to do something to do with the listing but unless you tell it whether you want to create one or delete one or update one, then it's not going to be able to give you the right functionality to enable you to do what you want. And then the final piece of the puzzle or the final complexity of APIs is that often when you send your request to the external app, they will need to do some kind of authentication on you to find out who you are before your request can get through and they can send you a response. Now, there are many APIs that don't require authentication. Um, but for ones where they want to kind of measure your usage because they don't want you to go over any kind of usage limits or the data that they are handling is uh, secure and they need to make sure that you are not going to do bad things with it and they will require some kind of authentication. And this can add a bit more complexity to setting the API up. So some examples of the authentication methods that you're going to come across uh, the first one, the most common one that you would have probably heard of is API keys. So a lot of services, uh, if you want to use their API, you need to get an API key. And usually that's in kind of a, a hidden section of the website and some developers bit or in your settings or something like that. You can generate your own API key and then you can plug that into your app and that will give you the power to be authenticated and to access the data that you want to or use their API. And API keys are fundamentally the same as a username and password, except for they are chosen by um, the app rather than by a human, which means that they're a lot longer than your average password. They're a lot more difficult to guess, and they can also be revoked very easily and changed for a new one. Some other APIs use something called HTTP basic auth, which is essentially sending through your username and password to their app, and their app will authenticate you that way. Other apps will use something called OAuth flow, which means you will send through a username and password, or rather your app will send through a username and password to their app. And in return, their app will send you back a token, which you can then use to access their API. And that token will be valid for a certain amount of time. And then after it expires, you'll have to go through that process again. 
Other more advanced APIs might use something called a JSON web token, um, which is only really used for like enterprise solutions such as like Google Cloud. And then finally, but less commonly used is a client side SSL certificate, uh, which is generally used more often in kind of internal networks rather than for external APIs. So of these five authentication methods, the most common one by far is the API key. Uh, and there's a couple of different ways you can use API keys, which we're going to cover. Um, but then it's worth being aware of the other ones. Uh, but the great thing about APIs is they always have, or they almost always have decent documentation, which will explain the type of authentication you need to use their API. And once you get used to reading that, it's usually not too difficult to figure out how to set it all up. So that concludes this kind of introduction theory session about APIs. I really, really hope it hasn't uh, put you off and I hope it's kind of explained things in a simple enough way. Um, but if it has put you off, please, please stick with it because in the next few sessions, we're actually going to be um, showing how to interact with real APIs and uh, use them to augment the functionality of your bubble app. And I think it's when you start to see how useful they are that you think actually it is worth putting in a bit of effort to, to learn this terminology, which is really all it is. It's just uh, a bit of new terminology to get your head around. And once you've done that, um, you'll just find that the, the power of APIs is just immense and it's absolutely worth knowing. Okay, so now we've talked a bit about the theory behind APIs. Um, I think it would be really good to actually dig in and try using an actual API and integrating it into our bubble app just so we can get a feel for uh, how complicated or how simple it actually is. So the API I want to start with is on this website, unsplash.com. So unsplash is like a free stock photography website where people upload really cool photos and uh, you can make them available for people in your app. So for example, in my app, which is a landing page builder, I have the ability for, for people to add unsplash photos to their landing pages just by searching for a keyword and then they get to select from a number of photos and I don't even have to host those photos on my own site so I don't have to use up any storage space because the photos remain uh, hosted on Unsplash's servers and I simply store the URL to that uh, the URL link to that photo and it displays on the person's website as if it was uh, uploaded into Bubble itself. So the reason I've chosen Unsplash as the first API I think we should tackle is because um, one, it's, it's fairly simple to do, uh, but secondly, I think it is genuinely useful and I would certainly recommend using this in, in like most projects where you need images. So the first thing you need to do is obviously go to the Unsplash website and here we have to then find out where their API documentation is. So uh, if we go onto this menu here, and you can see they've got developers slash API here. So we can click on that. Uh, and then we go through to unsplash.com slash developers, which is obviously the kind of developer portal. And here we see that we need to uh, register as a developer. But first let's look at their documentation. So this is a, a fairly standard API documentation site. Um, you can see like there's quite a lot of terms that you may or may not be familiar with and lots and lots of different uh, sections to the site but they usually are written in a fairly readable way. So if we read down this first page, you can see uh, they talk about getting started, how you create a developer account, uh, the need to register your application, uh, libraries and SDK. So we're not gonna be worrying about that for this. And then they have certain rules which are kind of unique to Unsplash or at least stock photography where uh, they're talking about crediting for the photos. So the, the person that took the photo and also um, this bit, which is quite important, which is hot linking. So instead of downloading the images and then uploading them into bubble, um, they're saying they require that you just use the image URLs returned by the API rather than downloading them and uploading them into your own app, because that enables them to track the photos views and things like that. So they can credit the photographer. So um, this is actually exactly what we want if we're trying to build a, a lightweight application. Um, but it's good to know that they have these certain guidelines. And you'll see this in a lot of APIs, they will have um, intended ways that you should use them and they'll have rules about things you shouldn't do and obviously you need to make sure you adhere to all of these rules otherwise you could be banned from using the API and then as we get further down the page they start talking about the schema so that's kind of the structure of the API the structure of the the different endpoints so 
you can see the the base API URL is just api.unsplash.com, which is similar to the example I gave of Airbnb. Uh, and then it's got different versions. So they're current currently on version one. Uh, and then they talk about the HTTP verbs, uh, which are the methods that we spoke about before. So they've got get, post, put, and delete. So they don't have patch. And then they give a quick description of them, retrieving, creating, updating, and deleting. So that's very similar to what we talked about before. Then they talk about what error messages you can expect if something goes wrong. So that's obviously useful uh, because then you can tell your app what to expect. If you're if you're building quite a deep API integration, like sometimes I will just ignore all this stuff, but if you're building an integration where you want to know if there's an error and you want to be able to return an error message uh, to either the yourself or the person using your app, uh, then this stuff is gonna be very important because you'll be able to debug what issues are happening. And then of course the important bit uh, or one of the important bits, which is authorization. So how does their API authenticate you? Um, how do you pass your uh, API key to them? Because although this is a free API, um, they do have these rules that they need you to adhere to. And they also have limits that you have to stay within. So they want to know who are the people who are using the API, which is why they require you to create an account. And that's why they have this authentication to make sure they know who you are. And then going a bit further down, so they also have a bit about pagination. So um, this, like in repeating groups uh, within Bubble, if you are asking them, if you're searching for a certain term in their database, uh, they don't necessarily want to return you every item in the database that matches that term. So they will do pagination and most APIs will do this. So they, it will limit the amount of results you get. And then if you want to see the next page of results, you just have to tell it that you want to see the next page. So this bit documents how they do this and how you can tell it you want to see the next page. Uh, and then they talk about rate limiting. So this is um, how many requests you can make to their API within a certain amount of time. So they're saying the limit is, uh, after you've been approved for production, the limit is increased to 5,000 requests per hour. Uh, but in demo mode, it's only 50 requests per hour. So when you're looking at an API like this, um, it's helpful to do a quick calculation of like how many times do you think your users are going to be uh, accessing the information from this API. And if you think it's going to exceed the rate limit, then uh, that might be a deal breaker for using this API. Uh, but certainly for uh, most use cases, 5,000 requests is probably fine. And then they give you some more interesting information about things you can do with the images. So they say that every image is a dynamic URL, which means you can create transformations of the image simply by adjusting the query parameters in the URL. So that's really cool. Um, so, and then they tell you about the parameters they support. So that's a really good thing to know if you wanted to use these kind of more advanced integrations of the API. And then here they're giving you some examples, which is again, very useful. So they say, if you hit the slash photos endpoint, you'll retrieve a list of photos. And for each photo object returned, a list of image URLs are returned under URLs dot star so this here this is json which is javascript object notation so it's basically just a structure that is very commonly used to send data uh, in apis so we'll be talking more about this structure don't be put off by it uh, it's very very simple to understand um, but in here you can see they send you this list of urls and then they have this open curly bracket and then they send you uh, a number of different URLs. They send a raw one, a full one, regular, small, and thumb. So these are all different sizes of image. And obviously uh, you would want to choose the one that is the smallest given your use case because you don't want to be loading huge images if it's only gonna be a thumbnail size. And here they're giving more information about using these dynamic URLs, which is really cool because they can create new images just based on um, you know the parameters you pass into the URL. And then they've got other cool stuff like a uh, blur hash placeholder, which um, I don't really know what it was before, but now, you know, you read this and it explains it very clearly. It's a, a compact representation of an image placeholder, which can be used to display a blurred preview before the real image loads. So that is, you know, super cool uh, to make a really nice UI in your app. You could have it show a blurred preview while the actual photo is loading and they provide all that for you. Uh, then they talk about content safety. So they've obviously tagged uh, their photos that may be unsuitable for younger audiences. Uh, and so you can use that filter to make sure you don't return anything that you don't want to see. 
and then now they're talking about supported languages so this is actually um, quite interesting for me because in my app people can only type in in English um, but I definitely have people who speak other languages who may want to be able to type in in their own language and get images back and then now we are getting down to the actual endpoints themselves so um, this one is talking about the current user which we're not really so interested in um, but then they're talking about getting a list of all users and you can see that the endpoint here so they tell you the method or the verb that you're going to use so get and then they say the um, endpoint so it's slash users and then this is going to be a variable which will be the user's username so you'll put this onto the end of api.unsplash.com slash users slash and then their username and you will be able to get information about that user's public profile and then they tell you here exactly what information you will get back so this again is the json that i mentioned before uh, and you can see here we've got kind of recognizable thing that we saw before with a, a list of different urls small medium and large and these are profile images of the user but then we also have all this other information like their uh, username name first name last name instagram handle uh, and all this other publicly available information and then if we keep scrolling down so you can get their portfolio link uh, so you can see a list of a user's photos specifically uh, and that's the endpoint slash users username and then slash photos and the photos that they've liked and their collections and their statistics and then okay so now we're into a different section of the endpoints which is photos so this is the one we're interested in so you can see uh, here they've got list photos and that's just just slash photos is the endpoint where they get and then they go through again the structure of the data that we're going to receive back so uh, again reading this you can see that you know we get the created and updated date we get the width and height and so on um, and then we get the name of the person that created the photo and their own we get all this information about the user as well their profile image and then down here we get all the urls of all the different sizes of this particular image and then because this is going to be a list of photos uh, we would expect to get this for every photo uh, in the list so each photo will get all of this information so it'll be uh, quite a lot of information but obviously we will tell our app what to do with it and likely we'll only be using a couple of fields from this entire um, data object anyway then this next one is telling us how to get a single photo so that's um, again a get is the method and then it's slash photos um, but then it's got slash and then this is a, the variable for the images id so if we put an id in there we will get a single photo back and it will be in a very similar structure or the same structure as all the ones here uh, and then we can get a photo we can get a random photo by doing slash photos slash random then if we keep going down we can get statistics of a photo uh, track a photo, download, update a photo. Uh, so this is a different method here. It's put, uh, but again, it's the same slash photos slash ID there. But instead of using get, it's put. So then we can update a photo. But obviously, um, we would need to have uh, a certain level of authorization to be able to do that. So we would have to have this right underscore photos scope, which means we would need specific authorization to do this action. We can't just update any photo in their system uh, unless we've got this and obviously they would only give this permission to potentially the the owner of the photo uh, we can like a photo unlike it okay and then now we get to search which is um, actually the one we're most interested in so here we get a single page of photo results for a specific query and it's get slash search slash photos uh, and then they tell us the parameters which we can pass through so uh, the main one, the most important one here is query. So that will be the search terms or the keyword that we want to search for. And it will then return us a list of photos. Uh, and then we can, um, this is for the pagination. So we can say which page number do we want, want to retrieve, but the default will be one, which is what we want. But then obviously we might want to say, uh, go to page two at another point. And then uh, this is the per page. So the number per page that's going to return. And it's telling you what the defaults are. So all these other terms, uh, you can see they say optional and they all have default values set. Um, so we can, essentially, we just need this one thing, the query term. 
um, and all of these others we can just leave for the default but it's good to know they're there because we can uh, access them at any time if we want to and then here it shows us um, exactly what we get back exactly the format um, and it, it makes the point that the photo objects returned here are abbreviated so you're not getting all of the information about every photo because I guess that would be too much um, but it says if you want full details of a, a particular photo then you need to use the individual photo uh, endpoint and then further down more information you can search collections search users and so on um, but we're not so interested in that stuff so we've we found what we want which is the plain search photos endpoint so let's have a look at how we can uh, integrate that in our app so the next step for us will be to register as a developer so let's do that okay so I've signed up and I've verified my email address and now I'm on the dashboard and it says uh, your applications and there's a very tempting box here to make a new application and then let's just agree to this so um, all the terms of use of their API uh, which are all fair enough but definitely read these very carefully um, before you sign up to any API because you don't want to fall foul of their terms so now I've done that um, created the app and it's saying we're excited to see what you build and it's also saying um, giving me information about how to apply for production level which is where I get up to 5,000 requests per hour and there's this checklist of things that we've got to adhere to and then you have to add a screenshot or video so you can prove that you're doing those things so I already went through this for my um, landing page builder and it's yeah a very painless exercise you just have to make sure you uh, tickle these boxes and then you can send them a video so down here if we keep scrolling down you see keys and here we have access key and secret key so these are our API keys and we're going to need these for the API connector in bubble so let's first go uh, back into bubble now um, so this is just an interface that I've mocked up which uh, we're going to use so the idea is you'll type a keyword in here and you'll click search and then it will go hit the unsplash API and ask it for images uh, that match that query and then we'll see them here so first if I go into the app and I go to plugins and then I go to add plugins and the top one is always the API connector which is the most used one I think so just click install on that and then done and now we have the API connector plugin so it's that simple and then just click add another API um, so this is the first API and you can see here we've got add another API so we can add as many APIs as we want and they'll just show up down here in a list um, it's not a very nice UI I, I fully admit that um, so please don't be put off by it so um, the first thing you see when you click add another API is this kind of gray box and then it has API name here and it says it pre-fills it with new API so change that to something which describes the API because uh, the name that you put here and the name that you put here in the specific call is what you're going to find within your app when you go searching for this API that you want to access uh, so from a workflow or from a repeating group so name it something that you're going to be able to spot easily in a long list of uh, a long list of things and then the next thing we want to know is what authentication does it need so it gives you these options so none or self-handled um, then private key so API key either in the URL or in the header so um, those are things we talked about in the previous session HTTP basic auth so that's when you have username and password you're sending through uh, and actually if I select one of these you can see it changes the fields that I can see uh, within the interface here so if I put HTTP basic auth then it gives me a username and password box but if I'm using one of these API keys then it's saying okay well the key name is authorization and the key value you're going to put here and then the, the development key value will go here uh, and and so on so each one has a slightly different interface um, and then if we go down to um, OAuth2 password flow there's a token endpoint here user agent flow starts to get a lot more complicated custom token um, we've just got token call headers here JSON web token um, you can see we've got uh, more inputs here and then client side SSL certificate so the I'm guessing we're going to need one of these two so let's go back to 
the documentation. And if we go down, or maybe we can go down here, so authorization, so public authorization. Most actions can be performed without requiring authentication from a specific user. For example, searching, fetching, or downloading a photo does not require a user to log in. So this is gonna be fine for us. If we wanted a user to be able to log in and make changes to their unsplash photos via our app, then we would need a specific user authentication, which is this uh, user authentication here. Um, but we don't need that, we just need public authentication. So therefore it says to authenticate request in this way, pass your application's access key via the HTTP authorization header. Okay, and then here it says authorization colon client ID and then your access key. And then it also says you can also pass this value using a client underscore ID query parameter. So what this is saying is we can also pass our access key in the URL itself as a parameter client underscore ID, uh, or we can do it within the headers of the request. So the header of an API request is like the metadata uh, about the request itself. So uh, generally of the two of these, the header is considered more secure because it's generally not, uh, not logged by intermediaries and or saved in browser history or cached or anything like that. Whereas URLs, although we will be using this in our API connector and no one will actually be uh, seeing this URL, they are slightly less secure. And it's also worth noting that um, URLs, so we're gonna come onto that in a second, but uh, URLs or i.e. the endpoints that you type in here are actually publicly accessible. So someone, uh, someone can look at your app and look at the code and they will be able to see the URLs of all your endpoints. Now there is a way of making them not publicly visible. And in fact, if we just use the private key in URL option here and put in our key value there, then it would not be publicly visible and that would be secure. Um, but there's always a risk that if you're using this method that you might forget uh, and one day you might accidentally put your uh, API key into this URL box here and someone will be able to access it. Uh, so of these two methods, I would recommend using this um, header option rather than in the URL. And also the other thing is access keys are quite long, so um, that would make our URL quite long and a bit more difficult to work with. So here it says authorization, uh, client ID, and your access key. So if we go back to our API connector here, and let me just get rid of that, uh, so let's select private key in header. And you can see here it already guesses that the key name is going to be authorization because that's pretty standard. And then we go back here, we know that it wants client ID followed by our access key. So let's copy that and paste that in there. And then if we go back to our dashboard here, uh, and we can see we've got these two keys, we want the access key. So let's copy that to our clipboard and let's go back. And where it says your access key, we're gonna replace that with our access key. So there we go. Important to leave the space there because these little things matter and that's why uh, computers and APIs can be quite tricky at times because um, we're, we're delving into the world of code where uh, a comma, misplaced comma or a colon or something can really make a big difference. Whereas no coders are just used to things just working and not being too concerned about syntax. But when we're working with APIs, uh, syntax is important and things like a little space there uh, is very important. So as long as we uh, read the documentation and note that they have a space there, uh, then we should be fine. So the next thing is to go down to the actual endpoint that we want, which was search photos. So here, this is the endpoint we want and we can see it is a get method and this is the url endpoint so um let's just go back up and get the uh, where was it so this is the api base url so we'll copy that and in our api call here we are going to say add another call okay so at the moment we had no calls um, but this means we can add specific calls within this which is all going to be the unsplash api so we could have you know, get users, we could have search collections, um, but this one we are going to call search photos. And we know it's a get, 
um, and this here you should be familiar with these now. Uh, so we just paste in that base URL and then we go back to the documentation, go back down to search photos and we're going to copy this endpoint here and we're just going to stick it on the end and we don't need two slashes. So um, that is the endpoint that we need. Now you'll notice that I haven't mentioned these two boxes. So the, this one is very important. Uh, so use as we get these two options. Uh, use as data means that we will be able to, um, if you have a group or a repeating group, you will see um, this API call as a potential data source. Uh, in the same way you would do a search for something within your database, you will have the option from a repeating group to use this API call as the data source of the repeating group. Uh, on the contrary, if you select it as an action, you will have the ability to use this API call in a workflow. So when you are creating workflows, it will come up as an option. So in this case, we could run the search as an action. So for the time being, I think we're gonna to want to use it as data, um, but we may actually change it to action a bit later and just see what happens. And then data type, well, we know from reading the documentation that it comes back in um, the weird, this notation with all the curly braces and the speech marks and the colons, and this is uh, JSON, JavaScript object notation. Um, so we know that that is the data type that we're expecting to get from this API. And this is the most common type of data you get back from APIs. Um, but it could be that an API is returning a different kind of data. So it does give you uh, different objects for the format of the data that you can get back. But in our case, we're going to select JSON. So now as we go further down in this uh, interface here, you can see we have headers and we have parameters. So headers, as I said before, are the metadata. So they're used for passing technical information about the API call through to the API. So in our case, um, if I go back here, I think, um, where was it? So yeah, so there was something that we could pass. So we encourage you to specifically request this via the accept version header. Okay. so. They're saying you should mention the version that you want in the header. So let's copy this. Let's do what they're encouraging us to do and add a header, accept version, and then copy that and paste that in there. So accept version V1, we could, from the sounds of it, we could leave this out and it would still work fine. Um, but I just wanted to demonstrate like, how you add headers in. Often you'll see a kind of standard one, which is a uh, content type is like JSON. Um, it hasn't asked us to do that. So I'm just going to leave that out for now, but um, to add more headers, you can just literally keep pressing this button and add in the key and the value. Uh, and as you've, as, as you've noted, um, the key is the thing to the left of the colon and the value is the thing to the right. So I'll get rid of those two. Um, so this box private here, this means um, that anyone using our app will not be able to see this value here and they won't be able to edit it. It won't be given them as an option for them to change in the interface, which is exactly what we want. So uh, if you have any sensitive data, and this is not sensitive, but if you did have anything sensitive in your headers, uh, such as your API key, uh, then you would want to leave this ticked as private. And that's really, really important. Anything that's not ticked as private um, could be viewed by someone who is using your app. And then the next section is parameters. So we know uh, from the documentation, if we go back to search photos, um, that it wants us to give a parameter called query, which will be the search terms we're looking for. Um, so let's do that. So we'll go back here and we'll click add parameter and we'll put in the key, which is query and just making sure we keep the same case and everything like that. And then here is the value. So again, we have the option here to um, keep this private or make it not private. So we are actually going to need to untick this box because if you keep it private, then you will not have the option to make that dynamic in the front end of the app. And we, we do want people to be able to type in the query uh, and have it sent through here. So we're going to untick private. Um, and then you get these two other options, which are allow blank and optional. And although they sound similar, they're, they're kind of different. Um, so optional would mean that this parameter is truly optional 
And if you don't provide it, then the API request can still run without it or can still attempt to run. Uh, and it just won't send through this at all, um, which is not what we want because actually we know that query is a required parameter for this API. And then allow blank uh, means that it will always send through this parameter, but it will allow it to have an empty value. So it would still send through query, but it would be query equals and then blank. So again, we don't want to allow that in this case because we don't want blank queries to be sent through, um, but they are slightly different in that allow blank will always send through the parameter, but just with a blank value and optional will only send through the parameter if it has a value, otherwise it will just completely miss it out. So in our case, we're gonna leave both of those unticked. And then here are two kind of useful options that you have. So one is to include errors that you get from the response and also allow workflows to continue. So if you had an API call at the beginning of a workflow and sometimes it was failing, uh, if you tick this box, then you should be able to retrieve the error messages from that, which are super useful if you need to debug them or you need to show a message to the user, like, uh, you know, your query shouldn't be blank. Um, so you could tick this box to get those errors and it would also allow workflows to continue afterwards. Um, otherwise, the workflow will just stop if the API call fails. And then the second one is capture response headers. So that means you will, uh, instead of just getting back the body, you'll get back all the metadata. Now, one thing you might have noticed is that it says here with a red triangle, you need to initialize this call before it will work. So for all API calls, you have to initialize them. And that just means essentially doing a test request, which enables Bubble to then receive the response back. And then you can tell it what to do with all that data it gets back. Because otherwise, uh, if you just started trying to use this, it wouldn't know what to do with the data it gets back. So uh, in order to do that test, we need to put in a value here for the query. So this essentially is a test value, um, which we're going to put in here. So let's put in dogs uh, and then click initialize call. So there's no error. If it hadn't worked, we would have seen an error here and it would have given us a bit of information about uh, what the error is. In fact, let's try it. Um, let's try it without this and just so I can show you what happens. So initialize call. Okay, there was an issue setting up your call. Uh, raw response from the API status quote, quote code 400, which means uh, it didn't work. And then errors it returned is query is missing. Okay, so it's telling us exactly what is wrong. So then we can just add that parameter back in query and dogs and untick private and then initialize the call. So this is the response that we've got from the API. And as you can see, there's tons of information here and this information actually should match up with the documentation here. So if we look down here, all of this information should match up uh, exactly with the information that we are seeing here. So you can see we've got total, uh, and then we've got total pages, and you can see underneath in very small font uh, in gray, that is the actual value it responded with. So it's got two, it's got 628 pages of uh, photos and the total number of photos is 6,271, which makes sense because it's 10 per page by default. Uh, and then you can see here exactly what that means, total, total underscore pages, uh, and then it has results and then it's indented, which means like here that this is an array. So anytime you see a square bracket within a JSON like this, that means it's an array, which means it's going to give you a list of objects and then the object is going to start with another curly bracket but this is kind of nested within this kind of outer curly brace so here we have the start of an array and then it's an object here and this is going to be uh, an image so it's got all the urls and so on and then you can see here that's the end of that square bracket but before that it's saying you're going to get more than just that one photo you'll get lots and lots of these so in our API connector, we can see that we are getting uh, all of this information back. And what Bubble is doing is it is taking a guess at what it thinks the format for these different data fields should be. So the ID is like, it's got letters and numbers in it. So Bubble has correctly marked that as text. It's got a slug, it's got created at. Uh, and Bubble's usually right, except when it comes to dates. Uh, it almost always marks dates as text. 
Um, so if these are dates that are important to you, so like if you actually care about when the image was created and updated and so on, then you could go through all of these one by one and you can mark it as date uh, Unix. Uh, and then Bubble will then recognize that as a date. And as a result, you will be able to use uh, all the date functions on these fields. But uh, we're not actually interested in these fields at all, really. We don't care when they were created. So you can instead choose ignore field uh, or you can just not touch them at all and just leave them um, because really we're only going to be using um, perhaps the URL regular from this anyway and also some information about the user so we can credit them so uh, if we look down here it says URL so those are all text so that's correct um, and then let's keep going down uh, username so we're getting the username of the photographer so this is all useful uh, all of this stuff all of these links are going to be text and then other things uh, yeah we don't care how many photos they have and so on so uh, if you want to you can go through one by one and click like ignore because that will mean you're bringing back le less data each time uh, but it's going to take you quite a while so um, I generally don't do that um, but then one important thing to, to note is that where you have things like this results list which is essentially an array the same thing as an array here which would be uh, marked by this square bracket this name here is going to be important because this is what you're going to be looking at uh, when you put this into a repeating group you're going to be looking at the API call itself so you're going to have to recognize it by its name unsplash API or whatever we called it uh, but then you're also going to be looking for the search photos result to get the list of photos so just take a note of that or a mental note anyway uh, and then if we scroll all the way down right to the bottom we see this little link here show raw data and if you click on that um, you can actually see all the raw data which bubble has interpreted and shown to you in this list here so we can see all of this json that was sent through to us and as i said it should uh, match up with the structure that they give you here but this actually has content in it which is why it's so much longer and so much messier because it actually has all these long urls and so on um, but just so you know you are able to see the actual response here so once you're happy with that and you've made any changes to any of these uh, that you need to then you can just click save and that means the call has been initialized um, so now it's ready for us to use within the app now if we make any changes to it then it will ask us to reinitialize the call um, which is not a problem because we can just do that very quickly uh, and it does that because any changes you make here might change the format of the data that is sent back so bubble needs to again ask you what it should do with all the data um, but for now this call is initialized and it's ready to go so one important thing to note before we continue is that um, any test values that you've put in here like this dogs um, it's a good idea to delete that out once you've done the test because if you don't have private ticks on that field then it is possible that someone could inspect the code of your app and view these test values so if you've um, had to use sensitive data like, like email address passwords API keys in any of these parameters for testing purposes uh, it's always a good idea to delete them out uh, once you've done that uh, and it says this call has been modified since you last initialized consider reinitializing re uh, we don't need to do that because we know that there's you know we were just del deleting the test value there's no actual change to the data we're going to get back so we don't need to do that um, obviously because it was just the word dogs we don't really need to delete it um, but I'm just showing you that uh, this is a generally a good practice is to clear out all these values if you don't have it set to private so now how are we going to use our new query so if we go back into our page that I designed here so what we can do is we can select this repeating group here which is just repeating group image and we can give it a data source so we can say instead of doing a search in our database we want to get data from an external API and then it says API provider so we have a few options here because we have the stripe plugin installed in this app we're seeing that as an option but we also see at the bottom unsplash API dash search photos so that matches up with the name unsplash api uh, that we gave to this overall api section and then the actual specific call itself search photos so if we had 
another call that was download photos, we would see that as an option as well. So we've selected Unsplash API search photos and then uh, because we had query selected as or deselected as not private, um, that means we have this ability to type something in here or insert dynamic data. If uh, we had, if I just go back to plugins and if I tick private there and we go back here, then you'll see there is no option to make that um, dynamic or insert the information here. So um, that is why we want to untick the private box so we are able to make a change to that. And then what we want that to be is equal to input type of keywords value, which is this box here. Uh, and you'll notice that these options here are structured um, just like the JSON that came back. So if I go back to the documentation, you can see we have total, then we have total pages, then we have results, and this is a list. So that's exactly what we're seeing here total, total pages, and then results, and then the final option, raw body text. So if we select results, now because we have the type of content for this repeating group set to image, um, this has kind of confused Bubble because what we've got here, results, is actually a list of loads of data, loads of different images, but not just the images, all the names and everything, the title, the users, and all this stuff. So Bubble is Bubble wants us to find an image it won't be happy until this data source has been set to a list of just images. Um, so what we actually wanna do is we wanna change the type of content because it's not going to be images alone that we're gonna get back. We're actually getting back a whole load of data for each image. So what we want to do is, in this list of type of content, now that we have initialized that API, we can see here that we have this option search photo which is the API, and we also have search photos result. And that is what we want to set here in order for Bubble to be happy that we are using search photos results. And so, as you can see here, this evaluates to a list of search photos results. And because the type of content is set to search photos result, um, Bubble is happy with this repeating group data source. Um, but this now presents us with another issue because in each cell of this repeating group, I had put an image, just a standard image here. I just dragged it in. Um, and now Bubble is saying, okay, you wanted to show images um, and you said the dynamic image should, should be the current cell's uh, image, but now each cell is not an image, it's a search photos result. So Bubble just wants us to tell it what uh, image within this search photos result we, it should be showing in this image element. Uh, and so if we open this up, you can see here that we have all of the different fields, uh, which we saw previously, we saw it in the documentation, we saw them uh, also in like the raw data that the URL sent, uh, the API sent back. Um, so the one we want are just the URLs uh, and we can pick the thumbnail, small one, regular or full. So I'm just gonna pick uh, small because that's probably fine for um, this use case. and really that should be it, it should work now. So let's go over here and update the page. And let's type dogs. And there we go, we've got a nice list of 10 dogs, uh, which is exactly the default number that the API returns. And they all look uh, really good. Now you'll notice that as I started typing D, it immediately loaded up some other photos. So um, because we've got the repeating group simply referencing this input here, uh, as soon as you start typing, it starts searching for the term you've typed in there. So that's not actually ideal um, because really we want it to be, you click search and then it, it does the search. We don't want it to be searching for random stuff that starts with D. Um, so what we can do is we can instead say, when you click search, let's set a state And let's create a new state which on the page itself, which is just going to be um, query and put that as text. So this is just a way to temporarily store the search term um, so that then we can refer to it from the repeating group. So the value is going to be um, input type of keywords value. 
and and then we also need to say for the repeating group um, the parameter for the query should not be the inputs value it should in fact be the state so that's unsplash that's the name of the page uh, this is the state we just created unsplash is query so that will be empty until we click search and then it will be populated great so if we now go back here let's type in cats okay so nothing comes up because we haven't clicked search as soon as we click search then all the images show up there so that is working perfectly fine um, and then we can also play around with some of the parameters so let's um, let's go back here so let's try changing this so per page uh, the default is 10 so if we go back into our uh, API connector here and we add another parameter put in per page so we can just put in a value here so let's put in 30 instead and then go back to our page so now we should have 30 images of elephants um, so what we've effectively done by putting in here is we've hard-coded the value in because you cannot change this from the front end of the app now if we unticked private uh, then we could go back to our design and we could say um, the uh, well we'll see here this this parameter now shows up here as it's something which we can make dynamic so we could have a little drop down here or a number that you type in saying how many results you want to get and you can make that dynamic or we could just edit it here um, but but that is the way of making the value dynamic instead of static. And another thing we could do is, as Unsplash said um, in their documentation, if we go back to the beginning, so guidelines and crediting, um, so you have to abide by the terms, follow the guidelines. So let's click through to the guidelines. And it says, when displaying a photo from Unsplash, uh, your application must attribute Unsplash to the photographer and contain a link back to their profile. So what we can do here is we can have a bit of text that will go underneath the photo and just do the normal things here. And um, so we can say this is equal to, so we can actually, let's type in photo from Unsplash. by and then insert dynamic data current cells search photos result and then we can get um, users username and then we can also add a workflow so that if someone clicks on that they um, open an external website and the website we can open is current cells uh, photos results and then if we go down users and let's have, um, I think there's one that's called uh, yeah, user links HTML um, so let's try that one okay so if we click on this and yes success so that takes us to this person's profile uh, which is exactly what Unsplash asked for. So that's really good. So now we are crediting people. Uh, and obviously we don't have to display it like this. We could probably um, make that a lot smaller and kind of superimpose it over the corner of the photo. Um, but wow, these are good pictures of tigers, aren't they? But yeah, you are now um, able to use Unsplash photos in your app. And if you wanted your user to be able to use them, um, what you could do is um, you could say, like, okay, if they click on a, one of the photos, you can make a workflow and you could um, say, make changes to the current user. And you could say uh, image, you can make a field called image and it would be text and it would be, um, so current cells search photos result and you would want say image URL regular and then you would also need to do um you would need to do like credit 
and that would be current cells, search photos, results, um, users, username, and then the link, credit link, text as well. And that's uh, user links HTML. So you could save these onto the user or onto any other data type. Um, and they are just simply text. So this is just a username. This is the URL of the image. And that's the URL of their credit link. And that could then be saved onto the users so that the user now has that photo as their, um, you know, their avatar or their, their banner photo on their, on their profile. Um, and yeah, it's as easy as that really to use Unsplash. Uh, now I know I've been talking for ages about this, but I just wanted to do one more thing um, because I think it's another really useful thing to learn. Um, so we have done everything that the Unsplash API asked us except for one thing, which is within their guidelines, they say when your application performs something similar to a download, like a user choosing an image to include in a blog post, you must send a request to the download endpoint returned under photo.links.downloadlocation. Um, so the reason for this is uh, obviously they are interested in the photos. They know what photos you are getting in your API request to have like a list of photos, but they are also interested in data on which photos are being chosen by your users to use as blog posts and so on. So they would like you to hit this download endpoint so that they can register data on this photo has been chosen out of like 10 photos of tigers. This one was preferred and this one is being used on a blog post somewhere. Um, so they ask you to do this thing, which is just requiring one more API call for us. Um, but it's good because this is one we're actually going to use as an action rather than as data. So what we can do is if we go um, back to our documentation here and let's find download. Um, Right, let's go on the left hand side actually, photos. Track a photo download, is that it? Uh, yeah, so to abide by the API guidelines, you need to trigger a get request to this endpoint every time your application performs a download of a photo. Um, so it is a get request and it's slash photos slash the ID of the photo and then download. Okay, so let's just copy this and go back into our API connector. Uh, right, and then, so let's collapse this search photos one and let's add another call. And this is going to be download photo or whatever you want to call it. And in this case, we are going to use this as an action because uh, we actually want to run a workflow that downloads the photo when a user clicks it. Uh, and it's going to be a get, and we know that the URL is going to be slash photos slash um, ID download. So I'm just going to expand this call so I can get the root URL. Paste that in there. Let's hide that again. Uh, so we need to put the photos ID in here. Okay. And that's going to be dynamic. So in order to do that, you'll see here, it says use square brackets for parameters. So we're going to put square brackets and then we're going to type ID into the middle of that. And that will automatically create this kind of dynamic interface here where we can now specify a dynamic value to go in there. So the key is ID that is just going to be filled right in here uh, by bubble. And then we say the value we want to give it. And then we are going to untick private because we, this is going to be dynamic. It's going to be different for every photo. And the value we want to give it is going to be the ID of a photo. Um, well, so the value we're going to give it dynamically for each photo. Um, but for the sake of initializing, we need to put in a test value, but this has to be, uh, we can't just put anything in here because it will fail. If we just put in a number, say, and click initialize, it's going to say couldn't find photo. Okay. So we need a real photos ID to put in here. So let's actually go back to the documentation. Let's take the ID that they have here. Cause you can see, uh, here is like the download URL and it's just exactly what we've got slash photos. Then it's got an ID then it's got slash download. So let's just copy. Uh, this ID here and see if that works because if this is a real photo then it should work Let's try initializing uh, Okay, so that's not a real photo couldn't find it. Okay, so 
To get the idea of a photo, let's instead just go back to our repeating group and let's put in another text field here and make that equal to current cells uh, photo results ID. Okay. And this will definitely give us the IDs of real photos. So, uh, monkey. And let's copy that ID. And then back in the plugin, put that in here as a test value and click initialize. And yes, success. So all it's given us back is a URL, which we're not interested in. Um, but we have run this, but we have successfully initialized that API call. So that will work fine. And then now we can delete that value out as we did before, even though uh, that is not sensitive data. And then we can go to our workflows. And so now we can say when a user clicks an image, it will save that information onto their user object. Uh, but we also want to, uh, and this is where you use APIs within workflows. If we go down to plugins and you'll see unsplash API download photo. So the reason we can see that there is because we selected that this should be an action and not data. Um, and note, we can't see the other um, search photos in here because that is uh, selected as data and not an action, but we can do this. And then it's saying, okay, what's the path ID? And it's asking us that because we unticked the box private here. Um, so here we can say current cell search photos result ID. So every time someone clicks on an image from the, the results that they've seen, uh, it will run this, it will hit this endpoint or run this API call to hit this endpoint and it will download the photo. And that is exactly what Unsplash want us to do. So let's just try that once. We won't obviously be able to tell that it's doing that, but we will be happy that it is. Uh, flamingos. And then click on that photo. So that has uh, run that API call and it has also saved these images to the current user, which the user can then use as a profile picture or whatever they want. Um, so I hope that was a not too lengthy but interesting introduction to APIs in Bubble. Um, it's all about this API connector and I know it doesn't look nice, but it is really useful. Um, we can just collapse this so you can see we now just have the Unsplash API. Uh, and then we can add as many as we want below it. And we're going to be adding more to this. But I think Unsplash is a really good one to start with because it's pretty simple, um, but it also covers things like authentication. And we've been able to use API calls that are both as data and also as a workflow action.